That's it, man. Game over, man. It's game over. Oh, no tears, please. It's a waste of good suffering. Fairly alarmed here. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Masters of the Nerdiverse podcast presents Ready to Scare, where we give a retrospective on the mix of horror and fashion, and we break down some of the most iconic characters to their, I would say, bone chilling looks and see how we can either critique or improve upon them. I'm, of course, your host, Mike G., and I am more than ecstatic to introduce to our little podcast Peter Porker Powers, our own Alejandro. How's it going, man? I'm doing good. Thank you for having me on. Absolutely. We're going to have some fun. As uh, Duke would say from The Predator, we're going to have us some fun. They're going to have us some fun um, <laughs> <laughs> right before he got his head exploded from a plasma exactly. caster. <laughs> nice. Yes, yes, yes. So we're doing something a little different. I'm, and I thank you for uh, being on this episode to kind of help me uh, break down the looks of these characters from this iconic film created by Clive Barker, which is, of course, Hellraiser. Hellraiser, yes. It's uh, What's your history with this movie? Um, have you... Um, did you see it at a young age? Did you see it later in life? I'm just curious. Yeah, so I watched the original original Hellraiser, I think, back when maybe I was like 10 or so. And yeah, I mean, back then I was like, oh, this is actually really creepy. Why am I watching this film? This is really scary. Um, and so I definitely took a while before watching number two, just because I was freaked out. Like, I think I remember like having some nightmare of like, just hooks grappling to me (laughs) right and of course nowadays i'm like oh it's like no big deal whatever um but i've watched hellraiser and hellraiser 2 hellbound and i haven't seen a lot of the other ones just i think honestly i didn't realize there were so many of them and i know there was recently like a new one that came out but i haven't watched that either i think just because i feel like with as the story continued through like films three through i think it's eight right there's a lot of yeah like i think clive barker's original vision kind of got lost a little bit absolutely and even with just number two yeah and even with just number two it was already kind of straying away from the book and what the stories were written said absolutely and just to give kind of a brief thoughts on that it's you're not missing anything out you know from three to like eight it's just <laughs> well, all that's good. yeah you're not missing much and i and that's me coming from a diehard hellraiser fan it's like clive's vision was really only really truly articulated when he directed it sadly enough in, exactly in hellbound and hell on earth and even uh uh the one in space uh, it was like hellraiser um bloodline like you mm-hmm. said the vision just strayed from the hellbound heart novel and just kind of the, what these creatures were supposed originally supposed to be. And I think that the first two films, if out of all of them really encapsulate the actual feel for these angels to some demons to others, you know, right. type of right. uh, creatures known as the Cenobites. And I think it would exactly. Be, I agree. You know what I mean? So absolutely. So I think a good place to start with our fire part introspective is to start with the most iconic uh, let's start with uh, the lead Cenobite, as he is known uh, in the original uh, casting. They didn't, uh, Clive has gone on record to say he never really wanted him to be called Pinhead. <laughs> it's not a name he really liked. <laughs> so he, he never really gave him a name. At, if, at the most, his original name was known as the Engineer. You know? uh, yes, yes. Uh, just because he was kind of like the train conductor on this highway to hell, or <laughs> this train <laughs> train way to hell, as it were, is it in what I love about their design uh, to go into kind of their individual looks was this almost uniformity mm. to, to their looks. It looks looks almost militaristic, you know, or even uh, religious based. I would say where it's just like this is their 
standard garb. You know what I mean? Just keep right. you know, making them a a a unit rather than individual aliens or predators or things like that. What makes them stand right? Right. I think, and they all wear this very fetishistic black leather um, that do resemble like religious clothing. Um, they also kind of resemble something you would wear at a butcher shop. Yes. So it's a nice little mixture of both, which I think accurately describes the Cenobites. Um, I mean, a lot of the clothing for all, all the Cenobites that we see throughout the different films uh, obviously carry their own supports pieces or their own supporting tools, their own piercings. Um, I agree with what you said about like how they are kind of religious because we do see them residing in a sort of monastery in hell, which is uh, Mm -hmm. governed by an abbot, has all these religious markings. And it's definitely shown even in the first scene where you see our Cenobites. Absolutely. Even the term Cenobite means member of a communal religious order. You know what I mean? Yes. So I think that Clive's was really, Clive was really pulling on that religious aspect to kind of give it a dark mirror to what uh, is the standard look for, you know, religious organizations. And like you said, it's that, it's a funny, and you mentioned it's a, it's a really nice blend of, of butcher <laughs> and, <laughs> and like, let's say a uh, priest, you know, or nun for that matter in regards to the female Cenobite. So I think in, actually a lot of their look uh, drew inspiration like from the punk fashion scene at the time. A lot of it was, yes, was from yes. the S&M clubs in New York and Amsterdam. Mm-hmm. And of course, Catholicism, you know, really helped uh, Clive Barker, who, is this, who himself is a great artist. If you've ever seen Clive Barker's artwork, it's really, you could tell he drew these out himself. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like he, it's just his <laughs> design. Cool. So let's go into the general look of Pinhead himself. Uh, Sure. Doug, you know, Doug Bradley portrayed the character as this stoic, almost soft-spoken villain that for the first time in horror movie history, you can actually just talk to. You know, I always thought that was a good, cool part of his personality, and it kind of was portrayed in his leather look. Um, we'll see, and I, like, I don't know if I agree that he's necessarily the villain of the films or the not. film series. <laughs> He's actually not. <laughs> That's a good right, point. Right, right. <laughs> yes. Like, I think he, for those who haven't seen the films, they see Pinhead and are scared and automatically assume this is the antagonist of the film, when in reality, Pinhead's kind of the one that ends up saving people. I love that thought, is that he is, they're more like a force of nature. You know what yes, I mean? Yes, yes. They're, they're not the, they don't, they're not the driving force of the story. And they're, they're more of just a, a I, I, it's so well done that they're more of just kind of like a seasoning, you know, based on the love triangle yeah. between Julia, Frank, and her husband. And they are kind right. of like the enforcers of their intentions. You know what I mean? Like, this is, this is you've reacted, you've acted this way, we are the reaction. Right. You know what I mean? That's pretty cool. Well, and even in number two with Kirstie, when Kirstie comes in, well, and, and number one, of course, mm-hmm. again, like, Pinhead they are not necessarily after her necessarily based on the actions of other individuals at play. And they really kind of are the ones that for lack of a better phrase, save her. Yes, absolutely. They do save the day. They bail her out on a couple of occasions, actually between the first two movies. And it's kind of cool how these are one of the only horror characters that can do that. <laughs> 